Airplane owners, do you want a smoother running engine that uses less fuel and produces more power? Of course you do. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Coming up. We're going to be talking about something called a GAMI spread check. And before we do that, I need to get into a little bit of how fuel is used to produce power in your engine. So obviously our aviation fuel is used to burn inside our engines creates heat, pressure, and does work. As it burns, it, it creates gases that expand with pressure, pushes a piston down, the piston turns a propeller, it does work. Everybody knows that. We're gonna talk about CHT, cylinder head temperature, and EGT, exhaust gas temperature. What they are, how they're related, and how this all ties into this GAMI spread check. Cylinder head temperature, well, your cylinder head is right at the top of your cylinder where, where your, your valves are. And that's basically the temperature of the cylinder there. It gets hot because there's burning gases inside it. And the cylinder head temperature is wasted energy because if you think about it, we want heat to go into expanding the gases and doing, and doing work inside the engine. If we're taking heat out of that and putting it into the cylinder head, that's wasted energy that is not being used to drive the propeller. So the higher the cylinder head temperatures, that's a pretty good indication the engine is operating at less efficiency. So the lower the cylinder head temperatures, the better. And that heat energy is obviously during that power stroke when it's burning and it's pushing it out, which then it's getting moved into the cylinder head to the fins. And then the cooling air takes the heat energy away from the fins and puts it to the outside air. EGT, exhaust gas temperature, is a measure of heat energy that's getting into the exhaust that is, again, just wasted energy because we're taking heat and just throwing it out the exhaust. In an ideal world, our CHTs would be low and our EGTs would be low, which means all the heat energy is going into driving that piston down and turning the propeller. So obviously the lower both of those are, the better. High CHTs is a measure of stress. The higher the CHT, the more stress the cylinder is under. It's a really good idea to have our CHTs low. Anything over 400 in a Lycoming, really you don't want to have because that's, that's overstressing the cylinder. And the more you stress the cylinder, the sooner it's going to fail or need overhaul. High EGTs is a measure of waste. The more EGT we have, the higher EGTs, the more energy we're just throwing away and sending it out the exhaust tube. Limiting the CHTs is a good way to extend the life of your engine, whereas limiting the EGTs does absolutely nothing for us. Nothing of use other than maybe saving some fuel, but it doesn't do anything good for the engine. The one exception is a turbocharger, which I'm not going to get into here. If you have a turbocharger that's driving off the output energy in the exhaust, then that energy is being used to drive the turbocharger, which in turn pressurizes the intake but that's outside the scope of discussion we're having here today. Now, what affects our CHTs? Well, obviously a power setting. If we're gonna put more power into the engine, more energy, it's gonna elevate the CHTs because we've got more energy, more fuel being burned and more work being done. Could be a limit in airflow over the engine, cooling air going through the fins of your engine. If we're, for instance, climbing out and we're climbing and we have high power setting and not a lot of air coming through the engine because we're climbing at a low speed, your CHTs can become elevated because we have not a lot, whole lot of cooling going on. As compared to when we're cruising, we have a lot of air, high pressure, lots of air going across the cylinder cooling it. Something else that can affect CHTs is our timing advance. If you advance the timing, that means the the mixture is burning earlier in the cycle. There's more opportunity of the burning of the fuel air mixture in the cylinder to actually spread heat into the cylinder head. Therefore, we have higher CHTs. Similarly, if we retard the timing, that means the peak pressure is moving later in the cycle and there's less opportunity for heat from that burning mixture to move into the cylinder heads. So typically our CHTs will go down for retarded timing. Mixture can also affect our cylinder head temperature because it directly affects how much fuel is in the cylinder. The more fuel you put in there, the more combustion that can occur, the higher heat you're gonna get within the limits. It affects how quickly that mixture burns. The fastest burn rate, which affects the CHTs, is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit rich of peak EGT. And one other thing that can possibly elevate our CHTs is something wrong with the ignition. Failed magneto, bad wire, bad spark plug. If the spark isn't occurring correctly, maybe one of the two plugs in the cylinder isn't firing correct correctly, that can slow the burn and cause more of the heat to, to be 
put into the cylinder head temperature instead of doing work and then being exhausted out. EGTs, well, everybody knows the primary effector of EGTs and that is mixture because you would pull your mixture to adjust your peak EGTs. Your peak EGT, or at the highest temperature you're gonna get on your EGT, is a stoichiometric mixture, which is 14.7 to one in terms of weight of air to fuel. So if you have 14.7 pounds of air, mass of air, versus one pound of fuel, put them together, that's the perfect stoichiometric ratio, and that is that is where all the oxygen in the air is used to burn all the hydrocarbons in the fuel. And that is where you get your peak EGT. When you lean the mixture beyond that, there's less fuel to burn, so less heat is produced, so the EGT comes down. If you have a richer mixture, you have additional fuel in there that has to get vaporized, and vaporization of the fuel requires energy. So it actually cools the cylinder by putting that extra fuel in there that also brings your peak EGT down. That's why when you're leaning your engine you'll notice the EGTs are lower as you lean it and it starts having less and less fuel to cool that EGT rises till you get to peak EGT and now you start taking away the fuel as you continue to lean and the EGT comes back down again. A couple other things that can affect EGTs, you have a, if you have a burned valve, so it's not closing completely against the cylinder head and exhaust gases are, are leaking past it, of course, if you have hot exhaust gases blasting past your exhaust valve, your EGT is gonna go up. Although it's not gonna go up a whole lot, maybe 50 or 60 degrees, so it's pretty tough to diagnose a burned valve just by looking at your EGTs. And the last thing, again, ignition timing. Advanced timing reduces EGT, retarded timing increases EGT because again, how much fuel is burned in the cycle and how much is just sent out the exhaust. The important thing to remember about EGT is that there is no set value. You can't say, well, my engine is over 1500 degrees EGT, so that's bad. EGTs in, 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 as an absolute value don't mean a whole lot. It's more about relative. And in terms of measurement, it's more about what is the temperature in relation to the peak EGT. So if we peak at 1500 and then we come down 50 degrees to 1450, that's, that's the number we care about, is the difference, the delta between the peak and whatever other temperature we're measuring. Ideally, all four cylinders would have identical CHTs and EGTs, which would mean the engine's running in a perfect manner with exactly the same cooling on all the cylinders and all the mechanicals and everything about the engine is running perfectly in every cylinder. It never happens, but in a perfect world, that's, that's how your engine would run, and it would be perfectly smooth and efficient running that way. But that's not a real world situation. But the closer they are, particularly the CHTs, which remember are a measure of stress, the closer they are together, the smoother the engine is gonna run. Because if you have four cylinders and they're all running exactly the same, now you have even power pulses. If, for instance, one cylinder has a little bit different in terms of power. Say the timing is wrong on one cylinder because your magneto is out, or maybe it's getting a little bit extra fuel or something that's causing one cylinder to burn a little bit faster or slower compared to the others. It might be producing a little bit more power, a little bit less power. Maybe the peak power is happening at a different place in the cycle, but whatever it is, that one cylinder is different than all the others. That means you're gonna get a different pulse so you have two pulses per rotation in a four-cylinder engine as, as it turns. And if one of those pulses has extra power, it's going to cause a little bit extra vibration when that cylinder fires. And that vibration is noise vibration harshness. You're going to feel that in the airframe. The engine is going to be vibrating. And it decreases efficiency. It decreases life of the airframe because vibration is bad for our airplanes. It's a good idea to have your engine running as smoothly as possible. The best way to do that is to balance the amount of fuel that goes to each individual cylinder to affect how much power each of those cylinders is creating. If you have a carbureted engine, it's tough to do because in a carbureted engine, the fuel is introduced in the venturi down in the throttle body, and then it travels up the intake manifold and it splits across into all four cylinders. And in that case, pretty much you're gonna be having the same amount of fuel in each unless you've got problems with the airflow inside the individual manifolds or if you have an intake manifold leak. If you have a leak in one of your intake manifolds and extra air is getting in that leak as it's drawing in the air fuel mixture, then that means that cylinder is gonna be running lean, more lean than the other three cylinders and you're gonna have a little bit of vibration. So this is actually applicable to both 
carbureted and fuel injected engines, but primarily fuel injected engines. The reason for that is for a fuel injected engine, the air comes through your throttle body, which is just a, a butterfly valve, and then it is drawn up into the manifolds, and this is before fuel is introduced. So right now we just have air with no fuel. Separately from that, there's a servo that determines how much fuel needs to be delivered. It sends the fuel up to a divider, which is what people call a spider on the top of the engine. And that divides that fuel equally amongst those four cylinders and sprays the fuel through injectors into the manifolds just before the intake port of the cylinder. In an ideal world, the exact same amount of fuel is being sprayed by all four of those injectors into the intake manifolds so that all cylinders are getting the exact same amount of fuel. That's not necessarily the case, and that's what the gaming spread test does. It's used to identify differences in fuel flow from individual injectors on individual cylinders. So how do we perform a GAMI spread test? First off, you're gonna to wanna to have engine instrumentation that can record what is going on. I have a G3X that records all my engine parameters once per second. If you have a JPI or some other kind of engine monitor that does the same thing, you're gonna want that. You can do it without it, but it's a lot tougher to do because you're gonna to have to be writing down things yourself as in the cockpit as you're running this test. You ideally want to be about six or 7,000 feet AGL because you want to be able to run your, your engine at wide open throttle without having power go above 65%. I know I said AGL there, I, I meant MSL, but more important than the actual altitude is that for the density altitude that you have and your individual airplane, you have to make sure that when you do this test that the engine output is at 65% or less and you should consult your POH to make sure that the situation, the altitude and the power settings that you are using ensure that you are at less than 65% at wide open throttle. Because we're gonna be moving our mixture throughout almost its entire range and if we are lower, we're gonna be putting our engine in a situation where it is in that red zone where we don't want to put it because it's harmful to the engine. Okay, so now we're at six or 7,000 feet. We're stable, level. We have the throttle wide open, mixture full rich. And what we're gonna do is over the course of about three or four minutes, very, very slowly and very, very smoothly, we're gonna pull the mixture from full rich all the way back until we start getting a little bit of engine roughness. And as soon as we get that, we stop. We're gonna sit there for a moment and then over the next three or four minutes, we're gonna again go back full rich. And we'll, we'll do that three or four times because we wanna get several different tests that we can average out and perhaps uh, discard any outlying measurements that, that don't match the others. What we're doing here is we're gonna be watching for each cylinder to peak. When we look at the data afterwards, we want to see what temperature did each cylinder have its peak EGT at. And at that point, when that cylinder hits the peak EGT, we're going to measure the fuel flow, overall fuel flow that the engine is consuming. In doing so, we can then determine the difference in fuel flow between the first cylinder and the last cylinder to peak. And the difference in fuel flow between those two is our GAMI spread. Ideally, we want that less than 0.5 gallons per hour. That will give us the smoothest operation. Now you can do this in a spreadsheet yourself or on a piece of paper, but the easiest way to do this is with Savvy Aviation, which I really recommend. If you have engine monitoring in your plane, get a Savvy Aviation account. It's really inexpensive. You can upload your flights there. They do all kinds of things like they can tell you if you have an exhaust valve failing or if you have any other kinds of problems, they will tell you. And if you give them this, this the results of your gaming spread test, they will tell you exactly what your gaming spread is in terms of gallons per hour. I did this on my plane and it came back as a 0.7 gallons per hour spread. So they said, recommended taking the injector on the number two cylinder of my engine and downsizing it slightly. With this information, I then went to GAMI. They have a website I'll put a link to below. They sell sets of matched injectors that they call GAMI injectors. I told them that I had stock 0 0.280 injectors in my Lycoming IO360 and showed them what my uh, GAMI spread test results were. They recommended that I go 5,000 down to a 0.275 inch injector which I did, they sold me, it was a $120, something along those lines. I put that injector in my cylinder too. 
right away, first flight, I immediately noticed the engine was much smoother. The vibration had went down considerably, especially when I was leaning. And when I went lean of peak for cruise, I noticed that I was able to pull much farther without the engine getting rough. Now with that new injector and my spread was much smaller, I was able to pull much farther back and get a nice smooth lean of peak cruise. My overall burn in cruise reduced by 0.2 to 0.3 gallons per hour. So that was a, a extra bonus that my airplane now uses less fuel to do the same thing. And of course it's smoother. The bad thing was my cylinder number two, the, the CHTs went up because I'm no longer putting extra fuel in there to cool it down. That was my hottest cylinder already. So that was a bit of a, an issue. I had to deal with some cooling issues to get more air up in there. Once I did that, the problem went away. So this is a very technical discussion that is probably not going to apply to a whole lot of people, but if you are an airplane owner, you have a Lycoming, a Continental engine, especially if it's fuel injected, and you are interested in doing this, I highly recommend checking out Savvy Aviation. They have a document in there that it tells you step by step how to go through all these tests. And of course, they will take your output results and read them and tell you exactly what you need to do like they did with me then you can go to gammy get your different injectors put those in and get a smoother running engine that uses less fuel i hope this topic is of use to some of you if you have any questions or comments please leave them in the comment section below or corrections especially and if you like this video click like subscribe to the channel really appreciate it when you do thanks for watching